Yeah, there you go. All right. So we'll, we'll just give it an, an, another few seconds. A few people are drifting on in. Um, hi, Paul. All right. So um, it's my pleasure um, this afternoon to introduce uh, Dr. Joy Wolfram. Um, Joy um, grew up in Finland, but also in Henley upon Thames in the United Kingdom. So that accounts for the perfect English and also um, the nearly English accent as well. I, I have to say, she she also speaks two of the world's most difficult to um, speak uh, languages for non-native speakers, Mandarin and um, Finnish. Um, so um, quite an accomplishment there. So presently, Joy is an assistant professor and director um, of nanomedicine and extracellular vesicles um, laboratory at the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville in, in Florida. Um, she also has a number of affiliations, uh, um, uh, one in China as associate research professor at the, uh, the Wenzhou Institute of Biomaterials and, um, um, of, and, and Engineering, um, and is also a, an affiliate assistant faculty member at um, Houston Methodist Research Institute. Uh, together with her academic appointment, she also is very active in the, uh, the biotechnology um, industry, serving on the board of um, Pharma Test Services in Finland, a company focused on oncology and skeletal diseases, um, and, and a scientific uh, advisory board member of Genomill Health in, in Finland, a, um, a company that's developing liquid biopsies uh, for cancer. Um, Joy did her postdoc in nanomedicine at um, Houston uh, Methodist Research Institute um, and did a really interesting PhD, um, 2012 to 2016. Um, it was with um, Houston Methodist, but she actually uh, matriculate, well, matriculated at Houston Methodist, but was actually present, resident in Beijing in China um, at, the, um, at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, and you know, for, um, for for folks who don't know, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is really emerging as one of the top research institutions in the world. There, are, you know, there's a large number of them in China now, and they attract both top Chinese scientists, but also scientists from all around the world. Um, so, um, um, and of course, um, she did her um, undergraduate um, and uh, master's degree um, in, in her native Finland. So presently, um, Joy is funded um, with a, a, a U54 award as a sub, a sub, sub award PI, um, and has also um, just been funded on an R21 um, with another R21 um, pending. Is the R21 on the um, uh, myocarditis or the? Yes. Yeah. So on my so the R, the funded R21 is a use of a nanotherapy for um, treatment of viral uh, myocarditis. But there's another one pending um, for looking at lung ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, and she, um, her CV is impressive from the funding point of view, and that, that she lists literally a dozen grants in the 40,000 to 80,000 K range, many of them fellowships for her students. Um, her lab numbers about um, eight individuals now, um, but she's actually mentored, mentored about um, 20 students. So impressive for someone that's only a few years out of uh, finishing their PhD. Um, um, Joy has received a lot of recognition. Um, she was shortlisted for the, uh, the Nature Research Award for Inspiring Science in 2019. Um, 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 listed with, this, is, this impressed me, 35 people who changed the world. That's, that's great. And also um, in Forbes 30 under 30 um, in the, uh, the healthcare sector. Um, which is, you know, a really significant recognition. Um, also gave a TEDx talk um, in Jacksonville. Um, and so, um, you know, is rapidly establishing herself as um, um, a leading figure in the, the field of uh, nanotechnology. Well, and one I particularly like was that she was one of 150 women that were invited from um, 25 countries all around the world to celebrate Marie Curie's um, birthday, um, which um, I guess there was a symposium at the Institute of Physics um, and Engineering at, in, in York uh, that, uh, that Joy was present at. Um, her, her H index is 23, which is um, wonderful. Um, lists about 50 peer-reviewed publications, um, and the journals include Nature Nanotech, um, Cancer Research, PLOS One, um, the ACS Journal, um, as well as the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, which is an up-and-coming 
um, um, journal in the field of um, exosomes and nanotechnology. And I, I you know, I don't, I don't want to take away any of her um, thunder by sort of talking too much about it, but one story of hers that particularly impressed me was a, a paper of hers that came out in Scientific Reports um, uh, a couple of years ago where she um, talked about um, repurposing of uh, chloroquine um, as a way of improving um, the performance of um, nanotechnologies by targeting macrophages in the liver. And I, I suspect we're going to learn a little bit more about that today. So um, with that, um, I'd like to welcome Joy to the, uh, the podium and I'm looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much. Probably the nicest introduction I've ever got. But, uh, um, you know, I've been very lucky to have a great team and amazing uh, collaborators. But what I'm really impressed with is uh, your institute here and the leadership by Dr. Friedlander and this growth mindset and um, what you're going to do in the upcoming uh, decade, I'm very excited to see. And in addition to that, to have someone like Dr. Gordy, who is a professor, but has something in phase three clinical trials, that's amazing. And that is, I think, really rare for academia, but as students and postdocs, to have someone like that and have that expertise, that's amazing. And so one of my goals with my career is to eventually, um, hopefully, try to get something uh, into patients so that we can make a difference. And uh, we definitely need those uh, role models in academia that have gone through that uh, process, as well as collaborating with companies. So that's, that's amazing that you have it, have it here. And back in August, I uh, visited um, the Blacksburg campus, which was also great to see, uh, and that you also collaborate and have this uh, transdisciplinary approach to research. And so thank you so much for, for having me here today. And so I'll talk about three emerging concepts in clinical nanomedicine. And I'll start by um, talking a little bit about what nanotechnology is, and then I'll go on to these three emerging concepts. One is exploiting hemodynamics uh, through nanomedicine. The second is modulation of innate immunity. And the third is the use of these extracellular vesicles um, that I know you're also um, doing here. And so what is nanotechnology? Well, it's technology on the nanoscale, so around one to a thousand nanometers, depending on um, what definition you look at. And so we know that, for instance, the sugar molecule is... Uh, but I can, I can stand uh, here if it's not working. No, no it's working. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we have uh, sugar molecules that are less than one nanometer, and then we have uh, viruses and bacteria that are examples of these uh, naturally occurring nanoparticles. And so I believe that nanotechnology really has the impact to, really has the potential to impact many different fields, such as computer science, um, where the size of computer chips becomes smaller and more efficient. Um, solar power technology um, within uh, nanoparticles and getting smaller and smaller units in solar panels is another example. And then, of course, we have medicine. And most conventional drugs are small molecules, so less than one nanometer. And then a few decades ago, we started seeing um, antibodies on the market, so around 10 nanometers. And today, we also have many clinically approved nanoparticles, for instance, 10 clinically approved nanoparticles for cancer in the United States. But what's very interesting is that compared to the first two examples, when we talk about nanotechnology and medicine, we're actually going larger. So what are the advantages of going larger? And so I think one of the main advantages is that if we have more space, because we're larger, we can add extra function. So we have multifunctionality, and I'll talk some more about that. But another thing that happens when we go larger are these unique electromagnetic properties that are not apparent on the molecular or macro scale, but only on the nanoscale. And we can tap into that for therapeutic purposes. And thirdly, nanoparticles are differently processed by the body compared to small molecules. 
and we can also exploit that um, for therapeutic purposes. And this uh, differential processing really impacts the final location of the nanoparticles within the body. But I'll start by briefly talking about um, multifunctionality. And this is a schematic uh, illustrating some of the extra functions that we can add to nanoparticles. Um, so the most simple example is solubilization. So as you know, a lot of the, for instance, cancer drugs that are given to patients are not water soluble. So to administer them, we have to mix them with toxic solvents. So these cancer patients are getting side effects not only from the chemotherapy, but also from the solvent. So to avoid um, the side effects from the solvent, we can instead um, encapsulate or complex the, the chemotherapy or the small molecule agent that is not um, water soluble with a, nan with a nanoparticle. And a clinically approved example is abraxane. So abraxane is an albumin, so protein-based uh, nanoparticle. Um, approved for several cancers. Another um, example is we can protect drugs from breaking down. And this is especially important when we're talking about RNA-based drugs that are very sensitive to degradation because there's all these RNases in the extracellular space and in the blood. So by encapsulating them inside a nanoparticle, we protect them from enzymatic degradation. And uh, when pathocyrin got approved, this was a huge step um, for nanomedicine. It's the first uh, small interfering RNA uh, to be used in patients for an inherited uh, condition. So hopefully we can see more of those uh, RNA therapeutics enter the market. A third example is immunoevasion. So many of the clinically approved nanoparticles have this polymeric layer, um, usually consisting of um, PEG, so polyethylene glycol, um, which attracts water molecules to the surface, and these water molecules will then hide the nanoparticle from the immune system. Um, and a clinically approved example is doxyl, um, which is a pegulated liposome, so a lipid nanoparticle with doxorubicin inside. And this is uh, one of the first uh, nanoparticles um, approved for cancer. Then, of course, we can also add targeting ligands, so specific um, molecules that recognize um, diseased tissue. There's been some phase one and phase two clinical trials, but unfortunately, a lot of these targeted nanoparticles have failed um, before getting approved um, and have not even entered phase three trials usually. And we don't really understand what's going on and why targeted therapy hasn't been working, but there are a few uh, theories to that, one being the protein corona, so all these plasma proteins um, cover the nanoparticle so they mask any targeting uh, ligands, which is why we don't usually um, see this approach working. We can also add imaging agents into the same nanoparticle as we have therapeutic agents, so we get a theranostic approach, dyes and other things, so we can simultaneously treat uh, a condition while um, also tracking where the nanoparticles are going inside the body. Um, in addition to that, we can add permeation enhancers that are going to help the nanoparticles or the drugs diffuse uh, in the diseased tissue. Um, for instance, in cancer where the extracellular matrix is very dense and uh, these have not entered clinical trials mostly because um, there could be a lot of side effects from breaking down extracellular matrix. Um, then we can have these triggered activation strategies. So a specific trigger in the diseased tissue will cause the nanoparticle to become active or to release the drug and probodies are um, traditionally not considered uh, uh, nanomedicine, but they are nano-sized, and this is um, a triggered activation strategy based on um, antibody. And finally, we can have drug combinations. So we can add several drugs inside, to, inside the same nanoparticle, um, and the benefit of this is that we can exactly control the ratio of two drugs or more drugs to give um, um, the best ratio to the cells that we're trying to target. And a clinically approved example is Vixius, which has, again, a lipid nanoparticle with two different um, chemotherapeutic agents in an optimized uh, ratio. And so within my own work, I've done some research on, on multifunctional silicon particles, uh, adding some of these additional um, functions and also liposomes, so the... Um, 
extracellular vesicle equivalent when we talk about synthetic uh, nanoparticles, and we've looked at various strategies. Um, but the second advantage when we are on the nanoscale are these unique electromagnetic properties. And the take home message here is that they don't appear on the molecular or macro scale, but only on the nanoscale. And these can be optical, magnetic, electronic, or thermal. And the reason that we see these unique properties is that nanoparticles have a large surface area to volume ratio, which results in unique properties, but they're also in the same size range as the wavelength of light. So because of this, we have unique properties. So for instance, what we've done in the past is uh, you know, inject gold nanoparticles into a tumor and then uh, heat them with infrared light. Um, but there's actually a clinically approved example of using um, electromagnetic properties of uh, nanoparticles, and it's called Nanotherm by the company Magforce. Um, it's been approved in Europe for, for many years. Um, and it's approved for glioblastoma and other brain tumors. And it's iron oxide nanoparticles that get directly locally injected into the brain, and the patient is placed in this magnetic field um, which causes the iron oxide nanoparticles to heat up and uh, thermally destroy the tumor. And then they've been trying to get um, FDA approval in the U.S. for a while, um, but the issue they're running into is that the U.S. Uh, FDA usually wants to see that things are biodegradable, and these are not really biodegradable. So after five years, you can still detect them in the patient brains, but this can actually be an advantage if the tumor happens to come back in the same location, you don't have to go and inject the nanoparticles again. You can just place um, the patient in the magnetic field. But I think they're making progress, and uh, maybe um, we'll get approval soon, if, if not uh, recently. And then the third advantage is that these nanoparticles are differently processed by the body compared to the conventional small molecules. And I'll spend a lot more time talking about this um, advantage because I think it's uh, more complex to understand. And so within the field of drug delivery, we believe that um, site-specific delivery of systemic, uh, systemically administered drugs can be improved with nanoparticles. So actually, a shocking number the first time you see it is that the conventional drugs, um, only 0.001 to 0.01% will end up in the location we want them uh, to go to, which is a very low amount. Um, but with nanoparticles, we can substantially increase this. So around 1% of nanoparticles that we inject systemically, so into the blood or taken orally, will actually end up uh, in the diseased tissue. And usually, because of this improvement in site-specific delivery, we tend to see increased therapeutic efficacy and reduced side effects with nanoparticles compared to the free drugs. Um, but one of the questions uh, we've asked this, is 1% enough? So how can we further improve site-specific delivery um, to increase the therapeutic effects and, of course, reduce the side effects? And so we know that all drugs have this therapeutic window, which is a range of drug concentration. So if you go above it, you get all these side effects. But if you go below it, you don't get any therapeutic um, efficacy. So if we could find a way to specifically transport drugs to the region of interest, then in the best case scenario, we could actually increase this therapeutic window. And so this is a simplified analogy of the drug delivery process, where the car represents the drug delivery system. And this road is the biological environment, and we're trying to get to the disease tissue um, that we want to treat. But in the middle, we see this fire pit. And this fire pit symbolizes the obstacles in the body that prevent the therapeutic agent from going where it's supposed to. So to in order to improve drug delivery, we can either optimize the drug delivery system, and we have examples of doing this, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And if it's uh, good enough, perhaps it can jump over, or drive over this fire pit. Um, but a less common approach is actually to modify the biological environment to improve drug delivery. And so we've also uh, tried approaches like this. But I'll start by discussing the design of these sophisticated drug delivery systems uh, to improve site-specific delivery. 
And this is really when we come to the first emerging trend of uh, clinical nanomedicine, which is exploiting hemodynamics. Um, and so one of the things we try to do by creating these sophisticated nanoparticles is to exploit the differences between healthy and pathological tissue. So one example is just cancer blood vessels or really any inflamed blood vessels, um, even for um, the, uh, cardiovascular diseases, for instance. And in this case, we tend to see that the blood flow is a lot slower um, in inflamed vasculature. And in addition, we see these fenestrations or holes. And this is because in tumors, usually the vasculature is immature, so it doesn't have time to form, form this continuous barrier. And, in, and during inflammation, you have different processes that increases leakiness. And because of this slower blood flow, um, we can try to take advantage of these differences, slower blood flow and fenestrations. So we've designed this disc-shaped microparticle. So this is around 1,000 nanometers. So a, an example of a large nanoparticle um, to take advantage of this difference, but to take advantage of the fenestrations, we've designed smaller nanoparticles. And in the next few slides, I'll illustrate how each of these particles interact um, with the fenestrations and the blood vessels. Um, so we can do mathematical modeling, and we've done that in experimental studies to show that this disk shape is optimal for flowing close um, to the blood vessel wall due to fluid dynamics. And then because you have this large surface area of the disk, it can also bind um, to the blood vessel wall. And in cancer or inflamed uh, vasculature, you have a slow blood flow, and so the microparticle will, will bind to the vessel wall and also stay bound to the vessel wall. But in normal vasculature, the blood flow is faster, and so the microparticle will still bind because it's designed to do so, but this will not be a permanent uh, adhesion. And so after figuring out the optimal um, diameter and shape, we sort of discovered that we reinvented platelets. <laughs> so, so sometimes, you know, you really need to get that inspiration um, from nature. Um, but if we compare this to the small molecules, conventional drugs, um, we know that differences in blood flow have less an effect on how the small molecules accumulate. So it's very difficult to take advantage of this difference if you're not working um, on the nanoscale. And so this is just, uh, again, a simplified uh, analogy of this. So the interesting thing is that all nanoparticles that are clinically approved are spherical and all the nanoparticles in uh, preclinical um, studies, or most of them, are usually this uh, spheres. So, but this is not the optimal shape because they tend to flow closer to the middle of the blood vessel. And so both in normal and tumor vasculature, um, we have a uh, few events of adhesion. However, um, in normal vasculature, we do see that these uh, discoidal particles uh, tend to marginate against the blood vessel wall. Um, but because we have higher shear rates, um, there is a transient adhesion. But in tumor vasculature or inflamed vasculature, um, this adhesion uh, is permanent if we design the optimal uh, size and shape. And so then when it comes to the nanoparticles that were designed to take advantage of the fenestrations in diseased vasculature, we know that they can easily enter if the blood vessels have holes. Um, and of course, in cancer and other inflamed vasculature, we get a leaky uh, characteristic with these fenestrations, so the nanoparticles enter. But in healthy vasculature, most healthy vasculature, um, they tend not to enter. So again, if we compare this to conventional drugs, we know that they're so small that they will go everywhere in the body, regardless of whether the blood vessels have fenestrations. So again, very difficult to try to exploit this difference um, if we're not working on the nanoscale. And so then we thought, why don't we combine this approach? Why don't we combine the disc-shaped microparticles um, with the nanoparticles? And so we use this porous silicon microparticles. And inside the pores, we loaded um, various nanoparticles, for instance, uh, liposomes. And these liposomes had uh, drugs inside. And we term this the multi-stage vector because it has multiple stages. Um, so after we inject 
um, this multistage vector into the blood, the microparticle here, um, you can see scanning electron microscopy, will bind to the blood vessel wall, and you see these characteristic fenestrations uh, in tumor vas vasculature or inflamed vasculature. And then, because porous silicon is biodegradable, it will start to slowly degrade, and as it degrades bound to the vasculature, it will then release these nanoparticles, so the second stage, and the nanoparticles um, enter through the fenestrations in the vasculature wall and can then deliver um, the third stage, the therapeutic agent, um, to the target cells. And so we've used this uh, multistage vector for many different um, diseases, including um, inflammation, but also many different uh, cancers. And this is just one example of melanoma lung metastasis. So in this case, the goal is to achieve high accumulation of the multistage vector in the lungs. And so when we compared um, the multistage vector, so the disc with liposomes, to liposomes alone, so conventional nanodelivery system, we saw that accumulation was substantially increased in the lungs. And here you see a quantitative analysis of that with the blue and black bars being um, the microparticle disks. Similarly, when we compared conventional polymeric nanoparticles to polymeric nanoparticles um, inside the disks, again, we saw higher accumulation in the lungs. So next, we asked whether this improvement in biodistribution, so exploiting the hemodynamics, um, could lead to improved therapeutic efficacy. And there's a lot of groups here but this uh, group is the multistage vector. So we saw that the tumor burden was reduced, the survival was improved, and the number of the metastatic nodules um, in the lung was reduced. So by optimizing the size and shape to take advantage of the hemodynamics of diseased tissue, um, we can improve the biodistribution and therapeutic efficacy. But since I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that my mission is, has always been how can we eventually try to help patients, um, we're always looking into this question. And at the Houston Methodist Research Institute, here on the uh, 12th floor, we have a GMP facility that is uh, manufacturing this uh, multistage vector. And uh, the team got a Department of Defense grant of 16 million uh, it's a breast cancer breakthrough award level four, and the goal is to bring this into phase one clinical trials. Um, and this was initiated by um, Dr. Mauro Ferrari, who is my PhD advisor, and was the president and CEO of the Houston Methodist Research Institute. He will now uh, move to Europe to become the president of the European Research Council. Um, but he's really the one that has driven this forward, and he's committed to, to helping patients. And this specifically, uh, this grant is for breast cancer lung metastasis. And so hopefully um, soon we can inject the first patients and see whether our animal studies uh, can be replicated in uh, humans. And many times we, we know that that's not the case, but um, we always have to keep pushing forward. And so just to conclude this first part of my talk of uh, exploiting the hemodynamics, um, there are several advantages of nanomedicine, and one is multifunctionality, one is this unique electromagnetic properties, um, but the one that we've really taken advantage of is that nanoparticles or microparticles are differently processed by the body, and we can create this multistage vector, this disc-shaped microparticle um, loaded with nanoparticles to take advantage of this, and this is an example of nanoparticle design. Um, but another way of improving drug delivery is modifying the microenvironment. Uh, yes. So with the disc-shaped uh, microparticles, when you have uh, slow perfusion and they're sort of decorating the inside of the vasculature, um, does their presence in any way, shape, or form <coughs> interfere with or modify uh, diffusion and delivery of various things, including gases? Is there any effect on gas permeability by virtue of the way they, I don't know if they, they form several together or put like a sheet in the vessel? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Usually when we looked at this by microscopy, we don't see that many 
adhering to the same space. So I think that would be a dose, uh, important uh, consideration when we talk about dose, but definitely it could be something that could be affected, but I'm not sure it would have a, a clear physiological impact. So if you, if you just took a controlled animal experiment, not cancer or anything like that, <clears throat> and you, you delivered these, and you looked at the tissue, you looked for signs of uh, you know, just overall health of the tissue with a variety of markers, you might, is there, is there any effect per se of just those uh, particles in the tissue preserved? Great question. So we'd have, we, we have had to do that, look, uh, ex, uh, you know, extensively into the safety um, to get this award. So we haven't seen any major safety concerns, but we can also tailor um, the biodegradation kinetics depending on the surface modifications. So if we want these particles can degrade within 24 hours, and so this, I, I'm guessing that this will also have an effect on the safety, but porous silicon um, is safe and we actually um, have a lot of um, materials in our food and for instance in vitamins that contain the byproducts of what uh, porous silicon degrades into um, that is then excreted by the kidneys. But excellent question, thank you. So how can we now modify the microenvironment as an alternative strategy uh, to improve drug delivery? And we looked at many ways of modifying the microenvironment, um, but I'll mention one of those, which is deactivation of liver macrophages, so modulation of the innate uh, immune system as the second emerging concept or trend in clinical nanomedicine. Um, so I mentioned that around 1% of systemically injected nanoparticles go to the tumor or diseased area. Um, but what I didn't mention is that up to 99% will go to the liver and spleen, and primarily the liver, and this is because the liver has all these resident macrophages, the Kupfer cells, um, that form the mononuclear phagocyte system, and these cells are trained to recognize foreign objects um, such as virus and bacteria that are in the nano size range, um, but of course also any nanoparticles. And so in a hypothetical example, Let's say we could block the liver by 1%, so that's not a lot. Um, in the best case scenario, this would mean that we could increase tumor accumulation by 100%. So this just means that a small reduction in what goes to the liver could have major consequences uh, for therapy. And so can we find a macrophage switch? Could we find something to temporarily switch off the macrophages in the liver? And so because we were thinking again about how can we help patients uh, quickly, we thought that we would try a drug repositioning approach to, so to screen some drugs that are already clinically approved for other purposes to see if they could um, modulate the ability of macrophages or Cooper cells to take up nanoparticles. And so we looked at some of these drugs and we found that chloroquine, this 70-year-old malaria drug, was actually the most effective at blocking the macrophages from internalizing um, the nanoparticles. And so we looked at many different uh, nanoparticles, six different nanoparticles, but this is one example of liposomes, uh, fluorescently labeled. We looked at three different uh, macrophage cell lines, Cooper cells being the resident macrophages in the liver. And you can see after three hours, they're already taken up uh, in large amounts by the cells because the macrophages are very effective at taking up uh, nanoparticles. Um, but when we treated them with uh, chloroquine prior to giving them nanoparticles, we saw that at different doses, in all cases, uh, liposome uptake was suppressed, and these doses were not actually killing the cells. So somehow we were inhibiting their, up to, uh, their ability to take up uh, the liposomes. And so then we wanted to make sure that chloroquine was not doing this to cancer cells because this would be counterproductive because we wanted the liposomes or the therapeutic nanoparticles to end up in tumors. So we looked at three different cancer cell lines, MDMB231, breast cancer cells, MIAPACA2, pancreatic cancer cells, and H358 lung cells. And at these doses, we did not see any effects on uptake, so potentially something that was uh, uh, macrophage-specific. And then, of course, we wanted to see whether this was the case in mice. 
So we did this uh, dose translation study. Um, so the FDA uh, recommends that you look at body surface area when converting uh, doses between species. So we took um, the standard dose for malaria treatment in humans and converted it into a mouse dose and actually ended up giving less um, than the standard human dose um, to these mice um, for the in vivo study. But before uh, we gave the mice chloroquine, we just looked at the, the biodistribution of these fluorescently labeled liposomes um, at various time points. And the goal here was to find a time point where liver accumulation was higher than plasma accumulation, because this was something that we were trying to, to inhibit. And of course, for all, our, all of our experiments, we're all uh, mice with the, again, positive control to kill all the macrophages. And we saw that tumor accumulation was increased. And with chloroquine, again, we saw a similar trend. And you may think, you know, this is not a lot to double tumor accumulation. Um, but sometimes getting double the amount of therapeutic uh, agent is the difference between life and death. And so next, we wanted to make sure that this was not just specific, specific for liposomes, but also, for instance, for the silicon particles that are a hard material, material a micron-sized particle. Um, so again, when we pre-treated the mice um, with chloroquine, we saw a similar effect, that we had higher accumulation in the blood, um, lower accumulation in the liver, and higher accumulation in the lungs, which was our target. So this suggests that potentially this pre-treatment strategy of modulating the innate immune system could be a broadly applicable approach. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we weren't killing the macrophages um, because we knew that this, this would be toxic. Um, so we looked at the macrophages in the liver and spleen here, labeled in green, and we saw that with the positive control, indeed, all the macrophages were gone from the liver. There was a reduction in the spleen. Um, but the mice treated with chloroquine looked very similar to the control. So this suggests that we're not killing these macrophages. We're just somehow deactivating them. And so we wanted to know what could be the potential mechanism by which we're deactivating the macrophages. So we did some uh, proteomic studies, and we found specific pathways that are related to endocytosis um, that are suppressed with the Kupfer cells treated with chloroquine. Um, but one protein that really stood out is this PCOM. It's pretty unknown. I know that it's been reported um, for Alzheimer's, but it's actually one of the proteins in clathrin-coated pits. And clathrin-mediated endocytosis is one of the main ways that nanoparticles are taken up. And so we found that chloroquine really suppressed PCOM sub, uh, expression, but not the other two uh, proteins in clathrin-coated uh, pits. So this could be one of the mechanisms by which this malarial drug is able um, to block the macrophages from taking up the nanoparticles by suppression of this specific uh, protein in clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So again, how can we potentially help patients with this uh, research? Well, the good thing is that in the US, physicians can give off-label use of drugs. So technically, this could be given today to a patient where we could give chloroquine plus any combination of the clinically approved uh, nanoparticles on the market. Um, but of course, we're also interested in looking at this in a systematic way, whether if we treat patients with a malaria drug, we can improve nanoparticle um, biodistribution. So for some time, we've been talking with a company that has one of these clinically approved um, nanoparticle drugs, and uh, they are in, interested in, in sponsoring us. It's been a, a long process, but hopefully soon. Um, this can get initiated, and this would be for pancreatic cancer patients. Um, but we're definitely excited about the possibilities here. And to briefly summarize um, this section, we know that the mononuclear phagocyte system is a major barrier um, for site-specific delivery. And we can try these pharmacological inactivation strategies to modulate the innate immune system, such as chloroquine and uh, Potentially, one of the mechanisms is this clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis suppression through PCOM. So then that takes us to the third emerging trend 
in uh, clinical nanomedicine that I'm very excited about. And so um, when switching from synthetic nanoparticles um, to extracellular vesicles when joining the Mayo Clinic, I thought that this was a really good transition because, of course, why compete with millions of years of evolution that has generated these extracellular vesicles for effective communication within the body. So what if we could tap into this system um, instead of trying to um, replicate this complexity on the, on the synthetic uh, side, which potentially could be um, almost impossible with all the manufacturing uh, challenges. And so, as you know, extracellular vesicles are lipid vesicles, so very similar to those liposomes that are approved, but a lot more complex in the surface characteristics. They're around 100 nanometers uh, in diameter, and they contain um, biomolecules that are uh, active, such as RNAs and proteins and sugars and lipids. And they're secreted by all cells, and they play an important role in cell communication. So I like to think of them as the text message system of the body. So if one cell wants to send a message to another cell, it can encapsulate it in this uh, extracellular vesicle. And so the research question that my lab has asked is, can we tap into the body's text message system to improve healthcare? And why do we want to do this now? Um, because there's a lot of recent evidence indicating that indeed these extracellular vesicles do play an important role in many physiological and pathological processes. So for many decades, they were thought to be mostly waste that the cell secretes. Um, but recently, they've really been linked to many, many important uh, uh, mechanisms. And why should my lab study this? Um, and that is because we've developed an effective method um, for isolating and characterizing the extracellular vesicles. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, why is this important? Um, because we believe that it could have promising therapeutic applications as well as diagnostic applications. Um, but today I'll show you um, the therapeutic applications that, that we're working on. So if these extracellular vesicles are involved in basically every process that we've looked at, then why aren't they being used in patients today? And I believe the major reason for this is production. It's been very difficult to concentrate and purify these extracellular vesicles from biological solutions. And the most common method used in the literature is ultracentrifugation. Um, but this is not really a good method because we get a very low quantity of extracellular vesicles. So we lose most of our extracellular vesicles in the isolation process. We have very low purity. So we have a lot of proteins that will um, co-pellet with the extracellular vesicles. So then what are we really studying in our experiments if we're also um, isolating these proteins? It's time consuming. So usually um, with this method, one month to inject one mouse. So imagine scaling that up for, for clinical studies. Uh, very labor intensive. There's a lot of steps that you have to do manually. Um, and as I mentioned, because of these reasons, not really clinically scalable. I think there's two companies in the United States that provides GMP ultracentrifugation, but extremely exp uh, expensive, um, low volumes, and a two-year waiting list. Um, and then it causes damage, of course, because it's like you in a roller coaster times a million. So the vesicles will aggregate, they release their content, and the membranes will get damaged. Um, and you also have this low batch-to-batch -batch consistency because you have a lot of pipetting steps. So you're introducing human error. And of course, the FDA, what's very important for them is to see that each time you develop um, a batch that it's consistent to the previous batches. And this is how we ensure uh, patient uh, safety and efficacy. Um, so can we develop an alternative isolation method um, to overcome all of these challenges with ultracentrifugation. And so what we've been working with is tangential flow filtration. And here you see a video um, of this process. And this equipment that you see is commercially available. It's actually advertised for protein purification. But if we take uh, th this equipment but choose different types of filters, different type of parameters, 
we have been able to effectively isolate um, extracellular vesicles. And we didn't have to reinvent the wheel, so it turns out that the main campus in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, for 15 years, um, they've been using tangential flow uh, filtration for oncolytic virus therapy, so for measles virus, uh, isolation uh, in clinical trials um, to destroy tumors. And then when we looked at the measles virus under the microscope, it looks almost identical in, in the size and shape and membrane characteristics to mammalian vesicles. So we, uh, we used their protocol for viral isolation um, as the basis for our extracellular vesicle isolation, as well as their cryoprotectants that they've developed to preserve um, the virus. And then basically how it works is that um, regular filtration, we just push something through a filter, um, but what happens is that we usually get clogging. But for tangential flow filtration, the liquid is flowing tangentially, so we avoid a lot of this um, filter cake formation. Um, so in this case, quickly this becomes clogged, and now we're no longer isolating the size that we're interested in. And you can um, choose what size you want to isolate based on the pores in these filters. So for instance, for us, we choose to get rid of everything that is under 30 nanometers, so all the proteins, and also to get rid of everything that is above uh, 600 nanometers. So we do this in two steps. But in addition to um, filtering and uh, selecting for a very specific size, we can also, or at the same time, we are washing um, or diafiltering the vesicles so we get a pure population based on size, and we're also concentrating the sample. And so this is all an automated process um, where we put in all these parameters. And after we've isolated them, we use nanocytes, and this video will um, analyze here the movement, and based on that, um, give us the size distribution and concentration of our extracellular vesicles. Um, and so we thought, why don't we then go and take the same starting uh, biological liquid and compare ultracentrifugation, the most common method, to our tangential flow filtration. And so we published this uh, last year where we saw that the yield, so the amount of extracellular vesicles that we got from the same starting material, was substantially increased with tangential flow filtration. Um, in addition to that, um, the purity was also substantially improved. And I think this stopped working, but we can go over here. Oh, your battery is running low on the PC. Yeah. Um, but we looked at the, the purity. So in this case, albumin, so a protein that is around 13 nanometers, so this is something we wanted to get rid of. And with ultracentrifugation, we see that we have very high amounts of albumin left. But with our method, um, almost all of the albumin um, has been washed out. And then uh, we wanted to make sure that we could use different types of uh, biological fluids with tangential flow filtration. So we looked at cell culture media, which is a very simple liquid because we know approximately what we're putting inside, and we saw that um, we could have higher batch-to-batch -batch consistency than uh, with ultracentrifugation, and here you see the ultracentrifugation uh, graphs have uh, several peaks all over the place, while the TFF graphs are very similar. Um, the scale bar is different here, but if you look at the, the scale on the same level, you can see that batch-to-batch -batch consistency is improved. We see this actually uh, vesicle-specific markers CD63, CD81, um, that are enriched in our extracellular vesicles, and also the H represents the cell hom homogenate as a control. So we want to make sure that we're isolating extracellular vesicles and not intracellular vesicles. So calnexin is an intracellular marker, so we see that we don't have anything in our extracellular vesicle population. Then we can do also um, transmission electron microscopy to verify that these are nanocytes. But in addition to that, we can use more complex liquids uh, like patient-derived lipoaspirate and verify that we get um, good batch-to-batch -batch consistency with tangential flow filtration. And we also see these uh, extracellular vesicle-enriched uh, markers. However, we do have a little bit of calnexin here, and this is be probably because when the surgeon is taking um, 
the fat, some of the cells uh, break during that uh, liposuction procedure. And so we've um, worked on now finding great applications for these extracellular vesicles and now that we've optimized an isolation method. So one of the projects we worked on is treating myocarditis and myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle. I think many of you are familiar with this condition and it's responsible for 20% of all sudden deaths in the US uh, for uh, young adults. And so it's relatively rare, but it is a devastating um, condition because we don't really have any uh, treatment options. And one of the main reasons in the US for this uh, condition is Coxsackie virus. And so we've teamed up with Dr. Fairweather, who has uh, for a decade optimized this model of uh, myocarditis, and it's a hybrid model between uh, viral infection and also um, uh, autoimmune condition. So what they developed is that they mix uh, the Coxsackie virus with heart proteins, and in this case you can use a substantially uh, lower uh, viral dose, um, so it's more clinic clinically relevant, and we see that inflammation peaks here around day 10 in these mice and we can see uh, histological signs of inflammation in the heart. And so we thought, why don't we take these adipose-derived extracellular vesicles um, to try to treat uh, myocarditis? And there's around over 200 publications in the literature showing that mesenchymal stem cells can suppress inflammation by secreting extracellular vesicles. So this is known. Um, even though the mechanism is debated, there's some microRNA, some proteins that have been found inside the adipose derived mesenchymal stem cell uh, vesicles um, that could lower inflammation. But again, we're talking about cell culture, and this has manufacturing challenges, even though we have this effective method of isolation. So it takes at least one month to just expand these cells. They will only show mesenchymal stem cell characteristics at passage four to six. So it's a very brief time period um, that you can uh, collect the extracellular vesicles. So you need to have um, large facilities, clinical grade facilities with a lot of cells um, to get enough extracellular vesicles potentially. The other thing is that you're growing these cells on 2D plastic usually. Um, so maybe we lose important native properties that are found in the body. You need to add, you know, exogenous agents. Of course, the, F the FDA does not like FBS because it's from cows. So you have to figure out how to grow this product without adding agents that could be harmful um, to the patients. And so you get very low extracellular vesicle yield. So a promising product because it lowers inflammation, but again, not clinically relevant. So what if we directly take the extracellular vesicles from human adipose tissue? Could these extracellular vesicles have similar anti-inflammatory properties as the vesicles from the adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells that have been um, extensively described in the literature? And so we've been working with our clinical colleagues using this FDA-approved device called Lipogems. It's developed by um, Italian physicians. And basically, you shake the fat, and this shaking will separate um, the starting product, usually it's not this bloody, but it will separate the cells um, from everything that is not cells uh, that goes into this waste bag. And so typically, um, Dr. Shapiro uh, will use this for uh, orthopedic purposes. So patients come in, they have knee pain, so they do a liposuction, and then they inject the cell portion into the knees. But all the, uh, all the vesicles, everything that is not cells, is thrown away on a daily basis. So then we uh, went through the IRB process to be able to collect these waste bags that are full of the extracellular vesicles that we're interested in. So that's what we've been doing. And we've put them through the TFF, but in parallel we've taken um, from the same patient. So patient matched cells, grown them for one month, and verified that they have mesenchymal stem cell uh, properties, took the media and ran it through TFF. So side by side we've compared this and we've shown that the sterility uh, can be maintained throughout this process. And for 50 milliliters of lipoaspirate, so all of us have 50 milliliters of fat to give, we get enough to inject cell adipose derived mesenchymal stem cell EVs to our um, 
directly lipoaspirate extracellular vesicles. And the interesting thing is that we found both extracellular vesicles and lipoproteins, which can be expected because tangential flow filtration is very good at getting a pure population based on size, but it cannot distinguish between different types of nanoparticles. So we're getting lipoproteins that are nano-sized. Um, and here again is a, a graph just showing that the yield is substantially higher when we take it directly from adipose tissue. Um, so then we wanted to look at the effects in macrophages. Previously, we know that the mesenchymal stem cell vesicles um, can lower inflammation in macrophages. Specifically, we looked at the toll-like receptor 4 pathway because it's the main pathway that has been linked to myocarditis. So if you take mice and knock out TLR4, they will show substantially lower um, uh, lower levels of uh, myocarditis and inflammation in the heart. And here we show that we used LPS ligand for TLR4, and we show that the adipose EVs taken directly from the patient could lower uh, various uh, inflammatory cytokines to a similar extent reported in the literature <laughs> and by us, by us when we compare it to the mesenchymal uh, stem cells. Then we also injected these uh, adipose extracellular vesicles or nanoparticles into this mouse model, and we found that these human fat vesicles could substantially lower inflammation in the heart. We saw lowered expression of TLR4. Um, we also had less infiltration of macrophages into the heart, and we also saw some interesting effects on the complement uh, pathway. And so, in addition to that, we've been thinking, I think I have one minute or so left, so I'll wrap it up. But we've been thinking of how can we take advantage of the endogenous properties of adipose extracellular vesicles, um, but also use them for drug deliveries to get this dual effect. So what we've done is we've loaded uh, these uh, adipose extracellular vesicles or nanoparticles with guanabens. It's an FDA-approved drug for hypertension. But in addition to that, in preclinical studies, it's been shown to uh, substantially lower uh, TLR4 induced inflammatory cytokines in macrophages. Um, so we show that when we load this small molecule drug into the uh, extracellular vesicles, it's, it remains inside uh, the vesicles for a substantial period of time, which is good usually in drug delivery. We're looking for this slow release system. We don't want all of the drug to be released into the blood. And we also see the gray bars here that when we add this FDA-approved drug, we can uh, further lower these inflammatory cytokines uh, in macrophages. Um, but in addition to small molecules, and I think Dr. Gordy will be excited about this, we've also developed a way of loading um, proteins into these uh, uh, extracellular vesicles. And what we do is we use cationic nanoparticles to load the proteins inside um, the extracellular vesicles, and we know that cationic nanoparticles, lipid or polymers, are very effective at transfecting proteins and RNA into cells. They work very well, but cannot be used in vivo uh, or in humans because this positive charge will cause immunotoxicity. But in this case, we see that um, after we have loaded the nanoparticles, the cationic nanoparticles complex with the protein into our extracellular vesicles, um, the SATA potential remains negative. Um, in addition to that, we see that there's a slight increase in size when we load the protein, and this is uh, Cas9. So Cas9 is 